This is the Slagen refinery plant near Turnsberg, at the entrance to the Oslo Fjord. Here, the first shiploads of home-produced Norwegian crude are brought on shore, coming from the Ecofisk oil field in the North Sea. To the Philips Group, this marks the end, so far, of a task which has required several years of exploration and preparation. It has also required enormous amounts of money and a new constructive approach to all sorts of technical problems. The vessel's tanks are inspected to make sure that all the cargo has been discharged and that the tanks are dry and ready to receive another full load of Ecofisk crew. If it is possible today to pump oil from the bottom of the North Sea directly into the tanks of a carrier, this is due to the fact that one has now learned how to master the numerous technical problems caused by the great depths and the difficult weather conditions. Never before had any similar operation been attempted in such conditions. It was necessary to invent and to build quite a new system of pipelines, buoys and mooring devices in order to ensure a safe loading. We shall see now how an oil carrier is moored and how it receives its cargo from the Ecofisk well. While approaching the berth, the captain maneuvers his ship with the assistance of the Phillips mooring master. During this time, the ship's crew prepare the mooring equipment, passing a 10-inch circumference nylon rope, or messenger line, around the traction winch standing on the bow of the tanker. The free end of the nylon rope receives a grapple, which will be used for fishing out the mooring line. This is a single boy mooring, or SBM. From the boy, a mooring line is laid out, and also a floating delivery hose. Both are equipped with pickup lines and several floating and marking buoys. The total length of the mooring line, with its pickup line, is 650 feet, while that of the hose string and its pickup line is approximately 350 feet, leaving a target length of mooring line pickup of 300 feet, into which length of line the tanker is now directed. The end of the pickup line is fitted with a large buoy in order to assist the tanker's captain during his approach. The grapnel is then lowered and submerged in the water about six feet, to allow for any roll of the ship, ensuring that the mooring line is caught. Prior to the tanker's approach, a standby boat inspects the berth to ensure that all the equipment is in good condition and that the mooring line and the hose string with their pickup lines and buoys are floating downwind parallel to one another. The vessel maneuvers in such a way that the grapnel will engage in the free length of mooring pickup at an angle of 30 to 60 degrees the wind on the ship's side tending to push the ship away from the buoy. Once the grapnel engages in the pickup line, the vessel's forward motion is arrested and the pickup line is lifted clear of the water by means of the hydraulic winch. The pickup line runs through the grapnel until it is stopped by a knot situated at the end of the line. The ship's crew are now able to get hold of it and tie it to the nylon rope so that the mooring pickup and the mooring line itself can be fed round the traction winch. During this operation, the grapnel is removed from the line. The mooring rope, made by the Samson Rope Company, was specially designed for this operation and is the first of its kind. The main section is 280 feet in length, allowing the tankers to be moored with a bow-to-boy distance of between 150 and 170 feet when five full turns of rope are on the winch, the balance being taken up by the bow-to-winch section. This range of 150 to 170 feet from bow-to-boy has proved the best one during numerous tests. The hydraulic traction winch can pull a load of 80,000 pounds during the mooring operation, 
and is fitted with automatic cutouts if the strain becomes excessive. Once the vessel is moored, the winch brakes can be set to any desired tension, thus safeguarding the installation. As soon as the ship's crew have put five turns of mooring rope round the winch, bringing the bow to boy distance within the optimum range, the mooring operation is ended and the hosing up can begin. By means of a small grapple, the pickup line of the hose string can be brought up to the ship's winch and the hose is lifted out of the water. The metal spool piece at the end of the hose is slotted into the saddle. There it is locked into place with a chain and a turnbuckle. The cam locks holding the flange at the end of the hose are released and the flange is removed so that the ship's loading can be connected to the hose string. The connecting mechanism is very simple and easy to release if this should become necessary. One of the ship's officers then makes a tour of the tanker, setting the valves ready to receive the Ecofisk crude oil. The captain contacts the Gulf Tide to inform them that all is ready on board and that all the necessary valves are open. Gulf Tide then tell the captain when loading will start. As the ship moored at the second buoy is getting close to her full cargo, the flow of oil running to her is cut back gradually and switched on to the empty tanker by adjusting the valves aboard the Gulf Tide. By doing the changeover gradually, one simplifies the topping up of the final tank of the now loaded ship and the empty tanker is allowed to check all connections and valve settings before receiving oil at the maximum flow rate. The loading hose between the buoy and the ship is 320 feet long and consists of eight 40 feet lengths of six inch floating hose. The loading rate is 42,000 barrels a day and the tanker loads over 300,000 barrels. This loading rate will be increased in the near future which means that larger capacity loading hoses will be needed but the principle will remain unchanged. During the loading, a radio schedule is maintained between the ship and Gulf Tide, and a constant watch is kept on the ship, not only in order to supervise the loading, but also to tend the mooring rope and the hose string. Weather forecasts are received at regular intervals from the London Weather Centre, and from the information received, the captain is able to assess the future weather conditions and decide whether or not it is safe to remain loading. Loading can be carried out in bad weather, even up to gale force winds of 40 to 45 knots, with sea conditions 18 to 20 feet, and sometimes a little beyond that, depending on the weather forecast. When the loading is nearly completed, the captain contacts the Gulf Tide supervisor, advising him of the estimated time left before the cargo will have to be switched over to the other boy. The supervisor, in his turn, passes this information on to the captain of the waiting ship, as he did at the beginning of the present operation. The flow rate is reduced, and the cargo is switched, and the whole loading procedure is repeated on the second boy. The valves and the butterfly valves are closed when the flow of oil stops and the dehosing can begin. 
The ship's hose is disconnected from the loading hose. The blind flange is put on again. and the hose string is carefully lowered into the water with the ship's winch. Then the hose pickup line is released. The mooring line is paid out while the tanker slowly moves back. support boys are replaced so that they can help keep the mooring rope afloat. The large boy at the end of the pickup line is replaced. tanker drops clear of the mooring line and makes for her discharge port. We have witnessed a complete mooring and loading operation as it should be executed under ideal conditions. But here, as always, when offshore operations are involved, unforeseen difficulties may turn up. This time, the wind, the current and the waves have entangled the loading hose, the mooring line and the pickup lines. When this happens, the mooring operation becomes highly complicated and valuable time may be lost before loading can start. The very difficult weather conditions, particular to the North Sea, will always represent a menace to the equipment. This mooring line is manufactured from man-made polyester and polypropylene fibers. The main section of the rope has a circumference of 21 inches, and it is the largest rope used in any marine operation. The double-braided construction gives great strength to the rope. It will stand a tension of 1,200,000 pounds, yet it is flexible and easy to handle. But when the North Sea shows its most inhospitable self, even the strongest ropes and the most specially built mooring equipment are of small avail. If the ship is not disconnected quickly, the mooring will break. This will result in difficult repair jobs in which both divers and tugboats will be needed. Even the normal repair and maintenance work on the boys is often risky and difficult. These jobs can only be done if the sea is calm and the weather steady. Specialists with special equipment are needed, as is nearly always the case on the Ecofisk field. The underwater hose string consists of 11 sections of 20-inch diameter hose leading from under the buoy to the seabed manifold 235 feet below. These hoses have to be checked frequently for configuration and any wear, and periodically need replacement. This is no simple operation, even in perfect weather conditions. One berth is fitted with surface hose consisting of 20-inch, tapered to 12-inch, and then 6-inch for experimental purposes, while the other berth has a complete string of 6-inch hoses. Time is money. 
The adage has never proved more true than on the Ecofisk field. Whatever is done here is done in spite of the elements of nature. Time and again, the North Sea has struck with blinding force, stopping all activities for long periods. But the men who have been and who still are engaged in this work have not been willing to abandon their task. Undeterred by the difficulties, they have fought on. And today, the result is there for all to see. Oil comes from the Ecofisk.